Can you hear me very well? Yes, I can hear you well. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear your voice. Okay. That's great. I welcome you all to this onboarding session. My name is Razak Mira, and I am your moderator for tonight's session. I am an ambassador for Flourish Opportunities Network. Introducing, introducing our guest speakers for tonight's session. Our first guest speaker is Mr. Dabo Eishi. Mr. Dabo Eishi is the founder and chief executive of Team Scribe Writers International, a full service writing firm providing services to a wide range of friends. King Scribe has worked with air goals and achieved satisfaction in the job market. WAC owns an LLB from the University of Nigeria in Suka. He has also interned in some of Nigeria's higher development and the economy. Also in the periodic portals, the white color network, we are just discussing. our onboarding session and also thank you for honoring our invite that's so happy to have you here tonight okay um thank you very much miriam for the introduction um good evening everyone i hope we're all well we're all safe where we are um i would like the session to be interactive um i would not ask you to on your cameras so hopefully and we can also have a conversation as this is going on because I believe this is something we are all interested in and it's something we can all learn from. So I would just briefly, just a few minutes, if you could just introduce yourself, we'll just take two minutes to do that, um, everyone, so at least we can have our names and we can continue on the first name basis. I hope that's okay with everyone. Yes, sir, it's okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, so who, who is going first? I'm going first. My name is Enoch Shita, a student of Lagos State University. I'm in the Department of Fishes and, Bio Fishes and Aquatic Biology. I'm from the level, sir. Okay, nice to meet you, Zainab. Okay, who's next? Um, Adebi, are you with us? Hello, Adebi, can you hear me? If you're online, if you'd like to introduce yourself, um, please, the floor is yours. Just um, your name, your faculty, and your level, so we can kick it off. Hello, so my name is Chiso. Uh, the F O N, ignore it. My actual name is Chiso. I'm a graduate of Law, University of Nigeria, Asuka. A branch of my classmates. So, hi. Hope you all have fun tonight. Nice meeting you. Again. Hello, Chiso. Nice to meet you. Although we know each other very well, so but nice to meet you on this platform. So um, without um, further ado, um, I only have 45 minutes to speak to, to all of you. I will just um, share my screen and so we can um, dive into the nitty gritty of why we're here today. So if you can see the screen, um, I would just want um, a response. If you can see the screen, just um, yes, we can see it. So um, I can kick off. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it. Yes, I right. can see this thing. All right. So um, I'm supposed to talk to you about um, the winning CV and cover letter. Um, first of all, I want to commend all of you for taking the time to come here. It um, shows your interest in um, your professional careers. It shows you're looking to get better. 
and you're looking to be a well-rounded student going into the job market. Um, now, my job here today is to just facilitate conversation and share some salient points, <clears throat> which sometimes students are not privy to when it comes to applications, when it comes to internships, and also for the future, uh, because I'm, I'm sure some of you might even be in your final year and will be going into the job market in, in a few months' time. So um, I'll just um, move on quickly. There will be question and answer session at the end of um, the, um, the webinar. So please feel free and engage as much as possible. So essentially, a CV and a cover letter. A CV, um, what it does for you um, is essentially to list your professional and your academic background for your potential employer. So it states succinctly what you've done in the past, the positions you've held, the schools you've been to, and um, just with the skills you have, which would make you a good fit for the organization. Um, if you look at the slides, so I um, gave uh, an example, the link, they're saying, that a CV contains detailed information, the work experience and academic background. That's essentially what you do with, um, with your CV, just to detail your professional background, your academic background. So someone who is looking to employ you sees your CV says, oh, okay, this person has, has uh, skills in, uh, in uh, um, cybersecurity, has skills in data analytics, just essentially just shows how you are the right fit for the organization or the company you want to um, work in or you are applying to. Um, now, you look at um, the slides, I would um, emphasize that hopefully after this um, session, you go through it and um, you, if you have questions, I'm willing to answer them. So now with uh, cover letters, cover letters essentially gives you um, a brief rundown of an um, introduction of who you are and tells your employer um, the skills you have and how those skills um, will be able to translate to results in their um, in their organization. So what you notice the disparity between the two is that in cover letters is a bit more succinct than the CVs and CVs are a bit longer than the cover letters. Um, now I would want to dive into the nitty gritty here um, because of um, time. We broke down the conversation here into three stages. A lot of you would have applied for internships in the past. I'm speaking from a general perspective, since um, you people are students from different faculties as well. So a lot of you would have applied for internships, or some of you might not have applied for internships, and it's the first time you are applying for an internship. You want to get the hang of it. You want to know what's acceptable, how you can go about it. So we broke down the stages of recruitment into three. The pre-application stage, the application proper, and uh, the post-application stage. But we're going to be focusing on only two today, the pre-application stage and the application proper. So the pre-application stage, what happens at that time is, essentially you do your research, you find out the organization you want to apply to. Say for example, you want to apply to, um, let's give an example, Cadbury. Cadbury, for example, you want to apply to Cadbury for an internship. So it's, you find out, um, the industry Cadbury works in, find out what are the products um, and services that Cadbury offers. So all these things help you build um, up your knowledge about the company you are applying to. And these things are essential because coming into your cover letter, you can use this information to then explain how you can add value to that firm. So I will just do a brief rundown. So it says here in 1A, do your research. There is no substitute for good research. So in any industry, you're, you're looking to break into and any company, any organization, research is the fundamental basis of anything you do going forward for the application. So it's advisable, you find out the company, what sector do they operate in, who are their clients? So things like this, what services do they um, offer? Things like this help you uh, in not just your application stage, in your pre-application stage, but eventually if you get called for an interview. So moving forward, the question here in, in um, the pre-application stage, one of the key questions to look out for, what are the requirements for the role being applied for? You have to factor this in um, in your application. This is the pre-application stage. So what are the requirements of the role? Some roles will say, okay, um, undergraduates, um, minimum of uh, uh, two one, or minimum of uh, an undergraduate degree at, for the role, 
Or you also find that some of them will say, oh, it's minimum of an undergraduate degree, but master's is an added advantage. So essentially, just find out if you're a good fit, not necessarily from a technical standpoint, but from um, the qualification standpoint. So moving forward, the responsibilities of the role, what would, are the tax you'll be carrying out? Now, I will tell you why this is important. If your duty as an intern or as a first year associate in an organization or a firm would be to carry out research, to learn support services. These are the things that were required of you while you are in the firm. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Okay. I want to hear from someone else. I hope yes, you can hear me. Yes, sir. We can hear you loud and clear. All right. Yeah. All right. So I'll just be checking in to ensure that um, um, the, the, the communication is going smoothly, that we don't have any hiccups. So just um, to continue, um, I said the responsibilities of the role, find out what are the duties, what are the tax you'll be given in that role, list them out, understand what is required of you, because that would also help you in your cover letter, and I will tell you how. Now, in your cover letter, um, it's going to be written in a formal letter setting. And what you're essentially you're doing in the cover letter is, as I mentioned earlier, tell them why you're a good fit for them. What are the skills you have? What are the positions you've held in the past? Briefly, um, which makes you a good fit for that role and a good fit for that company? So it's always good to understand the responsibilities of your role and be able to translate how um, your understanding of these responsibilities will lead to results for the company or for the organization. Now, moving forward. The, the application proper. Now, the, if you look at 2A from the slides, it says conduct a thorough CV review, edit your cover letter template to suit the current employer you are applying to. Uh, I cannot emphasize this well enough. Now, I would, before time, I would have, the ideal thing would be to have a CV and a cover letter as um, the split screen so that I can show some examples and begin to make adjustments where necessary. But what I can do is I'll share is a draft sample of a CV and a cover letter and it will be shared to you privately so you can go through it and um, you can see what it's like and the CV and the cover letter um, industry practice, what is acceptable and, and what is not. So moving forward, conduct a thorough CV review and have a cover letter template. For cover letters, if generally you might want to apply to more than one firm or more than one organization for an internship or for your role. So you see that for cover letters, you have to keep it beaten. And it's the standard practices. You can have one cover letter, one standard cover letter that you can use for firms. But what you just do is you edit them as you go on. I gave an example of Cadbury a few minutes ago. So if you apply to Cadbury, Cadbury, you found that, okay, Cadbury is in the, is in the um, uh, confectionery sector. Cadbury manufactures X and Y, then Cadbury, maybe they won an award in 2020, 2021. These are things you state to show that you've researched on Cadbury specifically and the work they do um, in their sector. Now, if you are applying to, um, let's say, Procter & Gamble, people, they, those, um, the company that makes your toothpaste or RLB and the rest, Procter & Gamble is still in the services sector, but you cannot use that same um, cover letter to apply to them. One of the reasons the, the address is going to be different. The, the contents to a large extent might be different depending on the role, depending on the, on the responsibilities you'll be given as an intern or as an associate of um, that organization. So um, it's always good to have uh, one cover letter where you can just edit it, it helps you save time. Moving forward, questions to consider for the application stage. Can you sufficiently explain your responsibilities in your previous roles? How did your previous, how did this help your previous employer and how can it help the organization? So for example, say you've worked um, in your school in um, Lagos State University. Let's bring it home. Say you've worked um, for an outreach, you've worked, you've volunteered, you, you led, um, say a gender, a, a, you led a match against gender-based violence in Lagos State. And you are among the organizer, uh, organizers of that uh, match from Lagos State University. Now you see that there are some skills that you have already through this experience, which will be of benefit to your potential employer. One of them is teamwork. You are able to work with people in teams. You are able to maintain um, cordial relationship and you are, and that's 
essentially drives you to results. So you can highlight this as one of the potential experiences you've had and how that skill you've gotten from um, that experience could help the organization. So now, um, moving forward, is there a gap year in your CV? So what a gap year means essentially is for a lot of persons who will be applying for an internship or just basically an internship in an organization, if it's your first application, there might be a, let's say a year where you might didn't, you didn't take any extracurricular activities or you didn't take online courses or maybe something, it might not be really be from, um, um, for, for, for want of try, maybe for personal reasons, we're not able to do um, so much on the professional side. I'm just giving a, a, a vague example as organizations usually ask this. So the gap here is just saying that, oh, that was, let's say last year or during COVID, COVID is a very good example. During COVID, you were not able to go out, so you couldn't intern or you couldn't um, take online courses or, so, or you know, one reason or another. But essentially, you should understand that, go through your CV and see if there is any year from the year you came into school to the current year where it must not really be an internship. You know, um, you look for things that you did in the year. Let's say you, you participated in the debate society in your school, you were able to, you won an essay competition, you participated in essays. But essentially what I'm telling you about gap year is that um, you have to understand if there is a year, if there is a gap year in your CV and just essentially be able to explain to your employer oh, why this is like that, if it comes up. Um, it might not come up during the internship stage, but if it comes up, you should be able to explain, oh, what happened is that um, I couldn't do this X and Y this year because of this, but um, I'm willing to come back and to learn and you know, I'm willing to learn from the organization. So that's just essentially uh, what we're looking to explain. So uh, things to remember before we move um, forward, for Lens, CV standard practice everywhere is usually two pages at, at most. And you see even mid-level professionals having a two-page CV. And some of them have more than 10 years experience in their field. So um, for a CV, it's, it's best to keep it at two pages. A lot of companies would, would like you to keep it at the page, but don't stretch it more than two pages. For cover letter, standard, it's one page. So we move forward. Noteworthy, avoid deadline day applications. Now, I would want to point out um, for applications where you've, you've come across, let's say the adverts for an application or the company puts it up on LinkedIn that we're faking interns for the summer period, you should be able to um, have the deadline in mind and work towards beating that deadline. It's, it's always bad to apply on the day of the deadline because a lot of moving parts at that point, you might make a, a typographical error. There might be an error in sending your email. You might send it late or uh, after the time. So a lot of these things, try to avoid them by applying before time. Um, I hope everyone can hear me up, up to this point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So just um, as, as, I, as I was saying, um, for your, your application, try and avoid deadline of day applications. Um, one thing you should also realize when you talk about um, CVs and cover letters, a lot of people don't point it out. As much as your education matters, as much as professional experience matters, for in, especially at the internship level, especially at the undergraduate level, it is not the sole determinant of whether you get an internship. So do not feel discouraged that maybe you're not intent before our companies will turn you down once or our organization will turn you down. It doesn't always work that way. Now, I want to emphasize soft skills. Um, can anyone give a brief definition of what they understand by soft skills? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but what is your question again, please? So the question is, what do you understand in your own words, in your own understanding, what do you understand by soft skills? Can anybody help us? Well, I, mean, I think soft skills is the skills you acquire before you acquire the main skills. I tried. Sorry, you know. sorry I didn't get that. Hello, I want to try. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, soft skills are 
the skills that are required to succeed in the workplace. What kind of skills? What kind okay, of example, skills? Can you give uh, an example of a, of a soft skill? Okay, communication skills. Um, ability to work in a team, like teamwork. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very um, helpful contribution. So essentially, soft skills are the major differential between a soft skill and a hard skill is a hard skill could be an example. Your degree, your degree is uh, is is um, one of uh, is it can rank as a hard skill. So let's say you've gone to school, you studied um, uh, account, you you studied law, you studied uh, accounting, uh, you've studied. Um, uh, uh, fishery, you studied. So all the, the, the whole time you were in school, the skills you've gotten from that, which have eventually translated into a degree, that would rank in many uh, um, organizations as a hard skill. Now, the soft skills are the ones that necessarily has to do with interpersonal relationship. So communication, as, um, as you rightly mentioned, communication, teamwork, leadership, these things are, are important for an organization. And I'll tell you why they're important. Because they are trying to, a lot of organizations look at wholesome development. So we don't want someone who is linear. So someone who, for example, has a first class, but is, has a, a poor working attitude with other people, or cannot work in a team. Or someone who um, has a first class, or do perform well in school, but has a master's from a very good school, but is in an organization and doesn't know how to um, um, relate with authority. So all these things, they matter. So it's not essentially always about your academic background and your professional background. Soft skills matter. So um, moving forward, online courses help. So I'll, now, especially on the graduate level, please try and take as many online courses uh, in your interest areas. Go to Coursera. Coursera is free. If, if, um, if they ask for a, you can ask for a, rather, you can ask for a fee waiver and they will grant it. Many a times they do grant fee waivers. So go to Coursera, find courses in your areas of interest, take as many as possible, as many as you can, and have them and put them on your CV when applying. It will help um, stand you out from, from, the, from the pack as someone who is interested in their craft. So the final thing I would want to say before moving forward is for your cover letter, a very important point, and I would want uh, um, you to pay particular attention uh, because a lot of people make this mistake. So in your cover letter, don't just tell what you've done in the past, but explain with examples. So I'll give you a vague example. Say you're a member of the debating society in um, Lagos State University in Lasso, and you've been in the debating society for three years, and maybe in, you've won a, a debate competition in one of those years. Now, there are a lot of skills you would have gotten from there. Public speaking is one of them. You would have gotten teamwork as one of them. But you should be able to say how or connect how this um, public speaking skill, teamwork skill was able to translate to results and what that could do for the, for the organization you are applying to going forward. So essentially, if you're putting this in your cover letter, you can say, okay, my name is um, Adenira and I've been a member of the Lagos debating of the Lagos State University Debating Society since 2021. We won the national Lagos State debates competition in 2022. And during my time in the debating society, I led a team of um, three debaters who and we discussed topics ranging from global warming to climate change to foreign policy. So you begin to you see now that you just don't, you just don't say I was a member of the debating society, or I learned teamwork from my time as a member of the debating society. So you begin to explain how that teamwork has come into play, how the public speaking has helped you. Let's say your, your time as a member of the debating society, when you came back to, to your classroom, you were given a um, team lead for a presentation for one of your courses, and you were able to um, organize a presentation, and you guys got um, marked for that. So this is just an example of how you can translate your skills and explain them to your your potential your potential hire so that it doesn't just look as uh, as an empty statement so moving forward um note worthy in your cv i would still touch on this hopefully if you have questions and i i, I hope you would have questions at the end specifically on cv and cover letters i will still go deeper i'm trying to be mindful of time so we don't um, stay too long so in your cv please if you have a draft cv um, with you um, ensure that religion, where people usually write religion, age, gender, 
state of origin. And toward the bottom of the CV, the right references available on request. So except where the organization you are applying to, the company you are applying to specifically request for these things, it's always best that they are absent in your CV. Um, this uh, shows that there is a kind of a blind process when hiring. So it's always advisable. If you have any of this religion, age, date of birth, state of origin, please um, remove them before putting in your application. Now, be mindful of the organization and the, the home address on your CV. I'll explain vaguely what I mean by this. Some, let's say you are applying to a company or, or an organization in Abuja, and um, you've seen okay, the company is in Abuja and you live in Lagos, and you know or you're going to, you may say you have an uncle, you have an aunt who stays in Abuja, and um, you'll be staying there during the duration of the internship although you live in Lagos, it's always advisable that if you're applying to that organization, you use your Abuja address in the sense that you could use your aunt's address where you'll be staying during the duration of your internship, or you can use your uncle's address where you'll be staying during the duration of your internship. I would explain why this is important. Some companies, some organizations, some firms, when it comes down to, when they are forced to pick between one of two candidates, at times distance helps make that selection for them. So what do I mean? So you can see that if you're in Lagos applying for a role in Abuja and you're using a Lagos address on your CV, the employer might not be able to call you and ask you, oh, say the person's name is Desmond. Oh, Desmond, do you have a, a place you can stay in Abuja? So one thing you need to um, factor in regarding your applications, especially when you have a place to stay in the city of where you're applying it and it's not where you live, try and use an address in the city, it will just give you that bit of boost if it's if um, distance is, distance is considered a barrier for the internship. So moving forward, um, another vital point I would want to point out: a lot of CVs are reviewed uh, in my capacity as a, as a as a founder of King Scribe uh, Writers International. A lot of CVs are reviewed, especially from the early early stage professionals, do not have their LinkedIn uh, profile on the CV. Um, it's always important to have that in hyperlink and or rather in hyper text. And why this is important is the person going through your CV, the HR manager, by be reading what um, reading your CV and say, you know what, let's visit this person's LinkedIn. Let's see if what is here is matching what is on LinkedIn. Let's see if they're active on LinkedIn. Um, so just before we go on, how many of you have a LinkedIn profile? Just by just if you have a LinkedIn profile, just unmute yourself and say, I have a LinkedIn profile. So I, I have a LinkedIn profile, sir. Okay, so that's two persons Miriam, Zainab, any other person? So only Miriam and Zainab have a LinkedIn profile. Okay, so essentially, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I would encourage you after um, this our conversation, you open a LinkedIn account. LinkedIn is very helpful for early stage uh, professionals. It helps you network with people in your field. It helps you network with fellow students as well. It also provides um, added motivation on some days. Maybe you feel, for example, let's say you got turned down on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the role you are applying to. LinkedIn just has a way of lifting you up. And because of the kind of um, young persons you meet, there are people who are pushing boundaries, people who are in your field and who are, um, just trying to make a difference. And in a lot of ways, LinkedIn will tell you that you're not alone. So whether you're, you're, you're a first time applicant for an internship, whether you are, you are an early stage professional, whether you've never applied before, whether you've applied before, LinkedIn always has a community for you and you can be able to source out vital information for, from LinkedIn. So I will encourage you after now, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, please, very important um, to, that you create one. So I've already discussed how the cover letter should be in um, formal, in formal letter formats. Um, now the final thing before I go over to the next slide is that if you have if you have good academic standing, it's always important to highlight it. So if you uh, let's say you've you're the, you're the first class on a high two one, it helps that you you you, know, you put it on your CV that oh I'm on a four point one four point two. Uh, from my last uh, semester examinations. Now, what this does is that it shows you're your a consistent student. It shows you're serious. It shows that you have a, 
at least on face value that you have an understanding of, of, of the course you're studying. Now, I would also encourage you, if you do not have, if you have not a high academic standing, um, it won't be a dense in, in a lot of situations, it won't be a dense to your application. The only thing you're, you should be able to do is, if you should be able to show how that um, your academic standing, which is although not of um, a required standard, or maybe not up to scratch, uh, what you have been able to do within that time period. So for example, have you volunteered? Um, have you, are you, have you held maybe some leadership opportunities just to be able to show that um, you maintain a balance? Um, but I would always encourage, um, do not feel that you cannot get internships because you are not on a high tour or you're not on a, uh, on a first class. So it's far from that. A lot of employers go beyond just your academic standing to pick the right fit for their company. So I'll move forward. So emerging trends in recruitment. I said I'll point this out um, towards the end of our conversation. Um, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world of work has started changing. So you look at both the corporate side and you look at business, um, and you begin to notice that a lot of work now is remote work. A uh, lot of um, employers also allow for hybrid work as well. So you see that um, there are new skills, or let's say there are skills that are now receiving added importance post-COVID. So from 2020 down to this period um, that, that we are speaking of right now. So essentially, you should be able to tell them if, if your internship of the role you're applying for is a, is a hybrid role or it's a fully remote role, you should be able to say that, tell them how you can still deliver, how you not being in the office, you know, does not affect your output. So you should be self-motivated. You should be good with time management. You should have good communication skills. All this will help when you're working from home. You know, some motivation um, will come into play because, you know, since you're not in the office and no one is supervising you, you should be able to deliver on tax as when due. So if you're given a deadline of, say, 5 p.m. for your tax, you should still be able to deliver um, on, on time, you know, as you are still in, uh, as if you were still in the office. So just, just essentially um, what I'm trying to point out with the changing role of work. You see that the data given here says that 48% of hiring managers of HR managers from 2020 down, they say that they are going to be given more remote roles. So there's good, from 2020 now, with, post, with the way COVID has changed the way we work, there will be a lot of remote roles going forward. So not to um, spend too much time, uh, you see that for cover letters, there is a changing trend. And I wanted to highlight this so that perhaps it could be the first time you're hearing it. Companies and organizations at this juncture are moving away from cover letters, from traditional cover letters. Now, there are still companies, there are still organizations that will say, you submit your cover letter, submit your CV, or submit your cover email. So a cover email differs from a cover letter because it does not have the address. So you just, <clears throat> you just have the content, and you end it, and you attach your CV. But now, there is an advent of what is a video cover letter. Some companies call it an introductory cover letter or an introductory video. So what that does is for you is you submit your CV, then you submit a video of yourself where you, for example, you could tell you, tell us who you are, introduce yourself, what is your motivation for applying for the role, and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, what is your motivation for applying for the role, introduce yourself, and how are you a right fit for the company? So that's essentially what would happen if you were to record a, um, a uh, video cover letter. So not to um, take your time, a video cover letter, I will just explain it briefly. You should be able to communicate how, why you are the best fit. Please, um, if you're in a video cover letter, be well-dressed, corporate dressed in a well-lit room and um, speak with confidence, speak with confidence. Video cover letters, they are watching your every move because now it's not just um, words on paper, like a traditional like a traditional cover letter. You are now speaking to them. They see the way you speak. They see if you're courteous. They see if you're, if you're polite in your remarks. They also want to see you know, how organized you are as a person, how your communication skills, where you're at in communication, where you can be able to pass your point across. So moving forward, um, the, the last point I would want to highlight in emerging trends in recruitment is a lot of companies are now adapting what is called um, applicant tracking system, an ATS. So what an ATS does is 
for a company that puts out a say there's an opening in the company and they put out a, a flyer saying oh, we're looking to hire interns or we're looking to hire first year associates or you know we're looking to hire graphic designers depending on the needs of the company and ATS what it does is that it sieves um, um, candidates, it sieves CVs and cover letters. So an ATS can be programmed to look at, excuse me, an ATS can be programmed to look at your cover letter. And if there's any typographical error, it puts your cover letter aside. So that's, it's very important you go through and proofread your cover letters before, um, before sending. So before I go on, because the next part is, is the conclusion, are there any questions up to this point, clarifications, suggestions, um, or you want to share an experience you've had in the past, and then um, you want clarification on that, um, the floor is yours. I would love to hear from you. Hello, can anyone hear me? Okay, Miriam, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for the session so far. So my question is, what's your advice on including perhaps our secondary school degree in our CV? Okay, so um, essentially, what do you mean? You mean your, your, the, your WAEC or... Uh, yeah, WAEC or NECO or something. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the question, and Miriam. So um, depends on what the... The company asks for now standard practices. Your since you're applying for an internship or you're applying for an entry level, it's already assumed you've gone to secondary school. So except when they say that you should include your secondary school and experience in your CV, it's always best you leave it out. It's uh, it's um, required you start from the undergraduate level. Say you are you're studying marketing in the Lagos State University, so you just say oh. Um, I'm a marketing student. I got into school in the year 2020. By I will be leaving potentially by 2023, 2024. My current um, CGPA is this. You understand? So just it's 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 best to leave it out, except where they specifically uh, require you put it in the CV. Um, any other question at this point before we conclude? Okay. So just, um, I'll be moving forward then. So the final words from me, honesty and integrity are two sides of the same coin. And this is a very important um, instrument of negotiation when it comes to, to um, the job market. Do not lie on your CV. Please, uh, I'll say it again, do not lie on your CV. If there's any experience on your CV um, that you have, you should be, uh, be able to explain it appropriately how you were able to um, serve, how you served in the role, the results that you were able to achieve in the role. So, but please do not lie on your CV. It's always better if you, you, it's even better if you apply with minimal experience and the company or the organization takes a chance on you and then gives you the role, then you lie on your CV and you get caught out. It'll be very embarrassing and it could have far reaching effects even in your career going forward. So I said, confidence is the glue that sustains the application process. So be confident from the pre-application to the application prior and to maybe the interview stage. Be confident. Um, is, confidence is bred from practice and from preparation and from ample research. So please um, be confident in throughout the process. You might get a phone call after your application that will oh, they want to do an, an, a phone call interview or a video call interview through Zoom. So just be able to project that you are sure of yourself and um, you believe that you can be of value to the company. Now, show a willingness to learn. Highlight this where possible in both your cover letter and the interviews. Now, for a lot of persons who would have, be applying for the first time, who are applying for an internship for the first time, and even if you're not applying for the first time, companies, organizations are, would always admire a candidate that show that they are willing to learn and they are willing to, to take instructions and willing to grow in the field. So don't come like a, like a know-it-all. It's always good to be enthusiastic. It's always good to be hungry for information, but just show that you have a willingness generally to learn and um, the sky should be your starting point. And final point, use formal language and be courteous while addressing the hiring managers or the hiring partner in your email. So if you don't know the gender of the email, just sir or madam in your, in your cover letter. 
or in your video conference, um, in, your, in your video cover letter, just uh, dear madam, as the case may be, if you have if you have an idea of the gender or it's clear the gender of the hiring manager or the hiring partner, you can then say yes, sir, or you can say dear madam. So final words, smile through it all. It's it's um it's a good, it's an refreshing experience, honestly. During my time as an as an undergraduate, I was privileged to intern with some of Nigeria's best law firms. And um, it has helped me even to this moment. A lot of things, a good number of things I know today about the corporate space, I learned from being able to cut my teeth or being given the opportunity to cut my teeth in an office setting. So smile through it all. You might have a few rejections here and there. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. Far from it. It just means you should keep knocking harder. You should keep trying. And eventually, you'll get the right fit for you. So smile through it all. And um, thank you for attending. I... I'm glad to have shared this moment with you and I'm open to further questions and further contributions going forward. So um, thank you very much. So, hello. Okay, Miriam, you have a question? Yes, please. Sure. So Thank you again for the session. It was a wonderful session. So my question is um, for we newbies that are just getting out of school and entering the job markets, we've seen and we've heard that um, industries or companies are looking for people with experience. You know, we see some kind of, um, uh, what is it called? We see some kind of job description and we are saying they want two years of experience, three years of experience. Whereas we as students are supposed to come to your company and gain those experience you're asking for. So what do you suggest in this case? Do we go ahead to apply for um, job opportunities that we don't meet the experience in the bid to like gain some experience or what can we do? Okay, so um, thank you very much for your question, Miriam. Now I would, um, I hope I'm, I'm correct in saying, I think everyone here, I mean, apart from I think everyone here is, is still an undergraduate. I hope I'm correct. Is there anyone here who, apart from Chisum, who is a graduate? No, sir. Okay. So now, um, one thing I have noticed when it comes to hiring trends is at the internship level, a lot of times, a lot of times, companies and organizations don't look for ample experience. You know, it's an internship you're an undergraduate, so they don't look for a lot of, they just, they just basically, especially for the first um, internship, they just um, want to see that you you have a commitment to work, you're willing to learn, you you are courteous, you can work within a team, you are teachable, just these things would show them that, oh, that you're the perfect candidate for them and they can now bring you in and show you the ropes. Um, for internships that require experience, it depends on, on, you know, the internship depends on the company. Sometimes you see an internship, like if you've applied for KPMG internship before, you would, would see that there are times there is a cap to the age, so they can say, oh, that um, you must not be 25 years or above us at the time of application or some other things. But generally, even for those kind of internships, they would just ask you um, for maybe your, your, your CGPA and your secondary school experience. So that's where they can act for that. Maybe they say, you, you, maybe you made, did you make five A's or rather did you make five uh, credits in your secondary school? Um, they don't generally ask for, especially at internship level uh, for experience. So uh, KPMG, for example, would you would go through their tests. I think KPMG and other big four accounting firms, you would, would PwC has a test as well. So to them, if you could pass the test, your you're, you're taking in, I think, after an interview stage. So I think for undergraduate level, they don't really ask for experience, seeing that you know it's an internship and it's, a, it's, a, it's at the undergraduate level. So essentially, generally, you should be safe if it's an internship you're applying for us at this stage. So um, any questions, any more questions from anyone? Or you want to share an experience? Okay, um, Angel, um, the floor is yours. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the um, 
what you've thought. So I want to ask a question for most students that are doing some courses that is not really related to what you want to actually do, because you know, most time in Nigeria, we are giving courses. It's not actually what you applied for, yeah? So um, for example, now I'm, an, um, I'm a fishery student and I love tech. So applying for an internship job in the tech um, ecosystem with my fisheries um, degree is it, somehow hard. So I really don't know how to, you know, balance it up. Is there a way to actually go around that? Okay, so thank you very much. That's, that's actually a fantastic question. And um, a lot of persons usually have um, these kind of questions, but they have not maybe had the platform to share it. Now, I would say that, um, Angel, you're not alone. You know, the, the way Nigeria is and the way Jan is, you know, someone might apply for a course and might get a, a different course, but, you know, you still have that passion. You still have that interest in the, you know, in the course you, you are looking for. So I would say this, find a way to distinguish yourself, and I can tell you how. Now, if uh, as you're studying fishery, you know you have a uh, passion for tech you can begin to nail it down. So if you have a passion for tech, what area of tech? Is it um, cyber um, security? Is it coding? So find out what specific interests you, um, you have in the tech industry. Now begin to pursue those interests. So for example, as I've mentioned before, go on Coursera and take um, um, courses. You know, since you're already studying a degree, which is not um, essentially um, um, your passion. You could take um, Coursera courses, you could take courses at edX, which would help augment what you're doing already. So what those courses would do for you, apart from showing a potential employer that, look, I might be studying fishery, or I might be studying animal husbandry, but oh, see my see the courses I've taken. I've taken courses from and uh, with certificate from Harvard, from Oxford, from, um, from Caltech, from MIT. So these things just distinguish you from from other persons and it kind of puts you in the same box of oh this person is a tech person this person has an interest in this um, field so i'll just narrow it down what number one is take professional courses look for courses on coursera if there are professional courses in tech law take them um number two i would advise uh, sorry not i said tech law so in, in tech generally take them now i would advise you would have um there's this agency, Nigerian Bureau of Data Protection. So attend their programs. I know they do a lot of stuff in Lagos. They do a lot of stuff in Abuja as well. Try and follow their pages, maybe on LinkedIn, follow them on Twitter, follow up what they do. They, they are in charge of data protection in Nigeria. They, um, they use technology to advance what we do, especially from a data standpoint. So attending their events and networking with, with maybe students like you, or maybe networking with some of the names in the industry, it helps as well. So I would say, you know, take um, those courses, attend events, and just generally read up. You know, since you're not studying um, tech specifically, you would see that a lot of things you would know at this point, you'd have to do it through personal reading. We have to do it through engagement with other persons, through discussions. So do not, um, don't be shy of um, pursuing knowledge. Buy books on it, download PDFs on it, consult people, engage in discussion. Um, I can assure you that, especially in the tech industry, one thing I love about the tech industry is that there is no discrimination or segregation as to the degree you're coming in with. So I know people who are in the tech industry today who have medical degrees, who are medical doctors, who, but who don't practice medicine. Same thing with lawyers who are um, uh, lawyers, but they don't go to court. They work from, it, from um, home and they work with tech companies. Some of them have learned coding. Some of them have learned, you know, um, Java, Python, and all those different coding languages. So I would, um, to, uh, to round off what I'm saying, Angel, find um, what specifically interests you in tech, list it out, and with all those things I've said, just pursue your passion, and the sky will be your starting point. So any further questions? Okay, Angel. And the floor is yours. No, no, no questions. Sir. Sorry, that was a mistake. Okay. Thank you very much. It's quite understandable. Thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, um, so I'll take it that we're all done with questions then. Um, Chisum, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay, so um, I think I think I think that should be it for my end. Thank you so much, Abere, for the for the lecture.